Okay, well, officially welcome uh, to those joining us for the uh, Lenten Lunch and Learn. A lot of L's um, <laughs> in that. Um, so the, the book that we're going to do, uh, well, there's a story uh, behind this book. Um, does anybody have a copy or has anybody tried to get a copy of the book? I'm sorry, what's it called? A Different Kind of Fast, Feeding Our True Hungers in Lent. It's not that on the I, I haven't tried to get it. Okay. So um, if you did try, I was going to see if you happened to be one of the lucky few. I got this about a month ago. Then we were going to study this. And then after that, it's just become like, you know, like Super Bowl tickets. Um, <laughs> you know, tough to find, impossible to uh, order. People will say, oh, yeah, we'll send them to you. And then they're like, no, oh, just kidding. We can't find them. Uh, Susan's Su 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 been working really hard to try to get a handful of them. I think huh. maybe by next week. Possibly. I I uh, emailed with Broadleaf some more, which is the publisher, uh -huh. asking, so if we order it directly from you, uh -huh. would that possibly be a quicker way? Yeah. And they said, well, assuming that we really do get it between the 15th and the 17th, uh -huh. it probably would be quicker. You know, as the sooner you get your work in, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So we might consider trying that. They said to wait until the end of the week and email them back and see where they're at with it if they really okay. did get it from the if printer. They got it from the printer. Yeah. I'm looking to see where Broadleaf is. Because um, part of the complicated, oh, it's in Minneapolis. Okay, okay. that's good. That's not bad. That's, that's not too bad. Yeah, because uh, Christine Walters Painter lives in Ireland. So oh, I was thinking, so if, if this was an Irish publishing, it would be really bad. Yeah. Uh, and she, you may remember her her name. We've actually studied a book of hers, the photography and spirituality book that we did a few years ago um, after my sabbatical. Uh, one of the books we did for that was uh, the same author. And so this is, uh, you know, a completely different topic. It has nothing to do with photography, but it also kind of does. I mean, there's a, there's a, you'll see... Uh, some similarities between some of the kind of visual spirituality that she does in that in those books, um, along with uh, along with what, what she does here. So uh, so yeah, so that's the the story with the book. We'll get uh, started uh, here in a minute, but let's let's pray first as we uh, begin our our time. We're going to actually do more praying as the uh, the morning uh, or the afternoon goes on, uh, but for the moment, uh, let's kind of pause. Uh, for a short moment of silence, and then I'll, I'll voice a prayer as we begin our time. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for Holy Week and the joy of Easter. May these next several weeks of Lent be a time of re-centering and refocusing upon you, that all that we are uh, might honor and glorify you, our Creator and uh, our Beloved. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And welcome, Deva. Thanks. Uh, so, oh, let's go around and study here who's in the room in case Margaret and David don't see everybody. So we have Dixie and Laverne and Susan and Marsha and Pat and Bridget. Wonderful. So we got a, we got a good crowd today with, uh, with everyone. So um, what are you giving up for Lent? Is anybody giving something up for Lent? I haven't this year because I um, I was taking the study and I wanted to hear what the answer is. The right answer. That's right. Uh, that's that is the right answer. That's good. Uh, it's 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 not quite a trick question, but a bit of a trick question because uh, oftentimes when we ask that question, it, it comes with a lot of. A lot of baggage, right? Um, you know, perhaps you, some of you may not know that question or not know what I'm talking about, but uh, oftentimes, um, and it's kind of come into pop culture recently, um, folks will say, well, I'm going to give something up for Lent. 
um, <laughs> give up chocolate. Uh, or I'm going to give Bridget <laughs> says never. <laughs> I'm going to give up social media. A lot of folks, you know, say I'm not going to do. I don't get. I'm not going to get on Facebook for for Lent. Or I'm going to give up um, uh, red meat or carbs. Or you know, a lot of times it's food related. Uh, and and that comes from kind of a long Christian tradition of fasting from different kinds of food. Uh, during Lent, um, you know, probably uh, a lot of us in our lifetime will remember, and maybe some of us have been Catholics, or at least we know Catholics uh, who have fish on Fridays during Lent, right? Because mm -hmm. that's part of the fasting process. Um, and, and and different levels of fasting over the years in the church, some have um, you know fasted from everything on one day a week during Lent, uh, and then fasted, for example, from meat every day I mean, not the fridays but every single day uh during the during the lenten season uh and so people will will kind of have turned that into a okay well i'm going to give up something that may be harmful or maybe something that i don't like or something that's not good for me i'm going to give that up uh it's going to focus on, on spirituality uh and christine walter painter uh asks questions like that but then begins to go a little deeper right so uh that process is fasting in the same way that we, we talk about fasting from food. Uh, and so it is fasting from something. Uh, but of course, the book title is a different kind of fast. Uh, and so her suggestion is that we think a little bit differently about this idea of fasting. Um, not that it's, it's bad to give up food or give up chocolate or give up something for Lent. She talks about uh, kind of some um, really important uh, connections with justice, knowing that there are a lot of people who don't have the privilege to give up food, that they actually have to not eat because they don't have the money or they're not in a, um, a place in the world that has enough food. Uh, they are perhaps in a, um, in the United States, but in a food desert or you know, still have access. Uh, and so she understands that for some people, that's, a, that's an absolutely meaningful um, practice in Lent. Um, but she also wants to, to ask some, some deeper questions than, um, what does she call it? Uh, uh, she says, sometimes people will give stuff up for Lent as kind of a, a, a second try at New Year's resolutions, right? Mm -hmm. So you made a New Year's resolution on January 1st and you've already failed. And so, oh, it's Lent, let me try again. I'll try to give up, I'll try, now I'll try again to give this thing up. Uh, and I think I think there's a quote I was going to read about that in here if I can find it really quick, uh, be, because um, you know she says there's there's some some good things. She says the kind of fasting uh, explored in this book is not a second attempt at dieting when New Year's resolutions have failed, only to be picked up for Lent. That would be a distortion of the deeper meaning of this practice. Um, she talks more about. Uh, she talks about being a monk. Uh, we usually associate that with, with a, a male, uh, but she says that, that the word monk originally could have meant male or female. Uh, and she says it comes from the, the Greek word uh, monokos, which means single hearted. Mm -hmm. A monk is one who lives away. Oh, you know that, that Margaret? Are you familiar with yes. that Greek phrase? Yeah. Um, a monk is one who cultivates a way of being that keeps their attention on the deeper dimension of life and how spirit is moving. She writes, I believe any of us longing for life of greater simplicity, silence, and slowness can call themselves a monk. So she's inviting us not simply to, simply to give something up for Lent, but to, to embrace the life of a monk uh, for these uh, six weeks, six and a half weeks. Um, uh, just a, a quick reminder of how Lent works. So there are six Sundays in Lent, uh, six weeks, uh, but the Sundays actually don't count against the weeks. So that's why there's a few more days um, earlier. That's why Ash Wednesday is the beginning instead of a, on a Sunday. Um, and so, so yeah, she, she, that's where we're beginning today, by the way, uh, because this is kind of the prep for where we'll go next over these next six and a half uh, weeks. So we'll have seven of these sessions for that reason. Uh, so yeah, so she says, let's let's talk about what what a, a kind of a deeper fast might look like. Um, and, um, and 
I want to get to some of her questions. She's got some good questions uh, about uh, some of this. Um, let's ask it this way, which which gets to some of the same question, but a, a little bit different way. So what are the foods or objects that clutter up your attention and your heart? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? I like to say I've given up all chocolate for Lind, L-I-N-D-T. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with doing something positive for Lind? Yeah, that's the right yeah. question. We're going to get to that here in a minute. We're going to get to that here in a minute. Uh, it's, not, it's not as simple as the pop culture, hey, I'm going to give something up. It's, it's, it's a little more intentional, but I think it's the right question. One of our one year um, went without food for a certain length of time uh, through the church uh, mm -hmm. because they wanted them to think about hunger. Ah, uh, right, right. Yeah, and that's, again, that's kind of what she mentions in terms of kind of in solidarity with those who, who are hungry, mm -hmm. those who, you know, regularly don't have the choice, you know, aren't are walking away from a full pantry in order to do this practice but simply don't have food in the pantry. And so, yeah, I think that's that's an appropriate way to do that as well. Anybody else, the foods or objects that clutter up your attention and your hearts? I've been trying to turn off the TV more, mm -hmm. not just for Lent, mm -hmm. but just generally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oftentimes we will... We will use, I mean, I think about that when I jump in the car, I'll turn on the radio, I'll turn on music or something, right? We need we need something going. Um, background. Mm -hmm. background TV or background radio or something as always. And we'll we'll dig deeper into this, but that's these are the kind of questions that she's going to be asking instead of uh, uh, simply, you know, just, just give up. Uh, uh, she doesn't use this language, but I think I used this maybe in the uh, invitation to the... For, the sessions is instead of um, fasting from the, the symptom, uh, we need to look deeper to say, well, what is the thing that that symptom represents, right? And so maybe it's chocolate, uh, or maybe maybe there's something else that, that chocolate means to us or means for us, or and maybe there's some nothing wrong with chocolate, uh, and it's it's not that the chocolate's the problem, uh, but there's something else uh, that, that we could ask ourselves what. What are we really hungering for? And so, yeah, that's that's a, another way. And then, and then to Dixie's uh, question, she asks this: So, when you imagine setting these aside for a time, what images come to fill that open space? Well, I loved what Jane read from that book, the, your class is studying on on Mark. Uh, what are you leave, lifting up, and what are you mm -hmm. leaving? Yeah. And I really like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great language. Let's hang on to that. We could use that this in a session. What are you lifting mm -hmm. up, leaving behind? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I always find that when I'm giving something up for a purpose of giving it up for Lent, mm -hmm. I end up just hyper focusing on mm. that and mm. it, it doesn't <laughs> right. create any greater enlightenment or improvement in myself at all. It just makes me mad that I can't. That's <laughs> right. So, so you give up yeah. Lent, or you give up chocolate for Lent and you replace it with always thinking about chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. yeah, no, that's exactly it's a great, yeah. great point. I read something a long time ago about giving up something for Lent. Uh -huh. And if you give it up for Lent and then take it right back up <laughs> right. after Lent, right. what has been accomplished? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it went on to say what Dixie said. Instead of giving something up, think of something that you take up. Um, mm -hmm. to, something to do. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to keep track of that. The, the, idea and that phrase um we'll pull this up here we're gonna get to this here in a second but i want to um 
What will you, what do you say, let go? What are you lifting up? What do you, and what are you leaving behind? That's it, that's it. What are you lifting up? What are you leaving behind? All right, and I know you can't see that on the uh, Zoom. You'll see it here in a second. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull that. I'll share a screen that here in a minute. But I wanted to capture that so we, because I think this is that's an important part of what we're we're doing here. Um, okay, so uh, another couple of, of quotes again. So she uses this language of, of, of monks, and then she talks about monks. She talks about uh, some of the the abbas and the amas, the desert uh, fathers and the desert mothers, um, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. go and practice um, some of these kind of fasting uh, lives. Uh, and they would fast from different things uh, and, and going uh, away from society. That was a kind of fast. Uh, and oftentimes there would also be a fast from uh, from food or a fast from um, um, speaking. I mean, we talk about silent retreats or silent, uh, even silent monasteries. There are some uh, monks that practice that very consistently. And so, uh, so yeah, these are these are some of the, the kind of monk okay. ideas. Thank you. And so uh, she writes. Um, uh, she uh, has a quote from uh, Abba Isidore of Pelusia, who said, "To live without speaking is better than to speak without living." But the former who lives rightly does good even by his silence, but the latter does no good even when he speaks. When words and life correspond to one another, they are together the whole of philosophy. Uh, and so she thinks a little bit about Isidore and thinks about, okay, let's think about the things that we are giving up, and then what are we taking up in, in the place of that? She says, we all fill our lives with words as a way to avoid what is really happening within us, whether we do it by our own words repeating old stories or turning up the radio or television to be saturated with the words of others, right? And so she's she's on board with the same the same questions. So I've learned to check in with myself. Do I really need this? Am I avoiding deepening into my own wisdom by relying on the words of others? This is a delicate balance because I deeply believe that books open up new wor worlds and I'm firmly committed to my ongoing growth. I mean, she wrote a book, right? So she knows words are important uh, and she wants people to buy her book. So she understands that that's a part of it. And yet, asking asking some of these deeper questions about what what are some of the words perhaps that we need to give up? Do we speak without, as, as Abba Isidore said, uh, do we speak without uh, living uh, as opposed to live without speaking. And so uh, there are ways that we, we just keep talking, even though it's not really um, wholly, uh, wholly speaking. Okay, so we're all going to be monks over these next several uh, um, several weeks. Uh, the um, Oh, there's another, another uh, kind of Greek connection she makes here. Uh, she says, the root of the word monk is also monos, which means one or single. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that doesn't mean a uh, single is in marital status as much as she says uh, connected to um, kind of singularity condition of one's heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she says to live with singular focus means I commit to living my life with as much integrity as possible. Both the word integrity and the word integrated share the same root. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to have to pronounce this for me if I, if I butcher it, Margaret. Uh, integratatum. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it has to do with wholeness. Yep, which means wholeness and soundness. Yep, that's mm -hmm. right. It's great having a Greek scholar in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and know some of this before, uh, before we can read it. Um, to act with integrity means to always be moving toward wholeness rather than division within oneself. Um, and so are you, does this, is this making sense? Let me pause and see. I'm throwing a lot of concepts kind of out at the same, uh, all at once. Is this making sense? Are there parts that are, are confusing? Uh, how how are you all hearing and taking this? It makes sense. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I think integrity uh, means to me focusing and centering on mm -hmm. the um, meaning of your life. Mm -hmm. um, right. On 
in my case, the meaning of Jesus life right, and right. what that means for all of us. Yeah. And then bringing that out in the way you live, um, mm -hmm. you know, talk, uh, walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the way you treat other people and um, animals and uh, just everybody around and um, how you want to spend your time helping mm -hmm. others. Yep, yep, yep. I'd like, I like the centering part because it's so easy just for your mind to be somewhere and then wander. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, um, Kind of in in multiple faiths and multiple religions, those that, that practice contemplation and meditation talk about that that wandering mind. Um, I think it's the Buddhists that call it monkey mind. Uh, it's kind of you know, or running around like a monkey the whole time, and that's kind of what our our brains tend to do, don't they? Um, well, that's a good segue then to how she invites us to be over these next uh, seven weeks. So. Um, uh, what she's going to invite us to do is engage in some really intentional practices. And so this is the weird, this is the part that gets a little bit complicated with the book. The book is actually designed, if you bought it and took it home and didn't talk to anybody for seven weeks about it, you could do kind of your own personal, um, um, almost a spiritual retreat. Uh, and she has a, something for you to do every single day. Uh, and I'll, we'll talk about, that's what the graph is here in a minute. We'll talk about what that looks like here in a, a second. Uh, and so for us, what I think what we can do is a little bit of a combo of that. Some of you might want to get the book if we ever get them. And um, you can do more of this. But then what I'd like to do is each week uh, practice some of the, the practices that she offers together. Uh, and then maybe offer a couple more for homework and see if you all want to, to kind of practice some of these things. Um, and so let, let me now, um, let me see if there's one more, I think there's maybe one more quote. Um, oh yeah, so she's talked about integrity. Uh, she's talked about um, kind of this idea of, uh, of, of, of letting go, but then also picking up. But then she also talks about one more theme that, that I want to kind of lift uh, into our, our awareness. And that's the theme of humility. Uh, she she warns actually humility can become problematic because it can become kind of abusive uh, to say well you just need to be more humble right <laughs> when you when you prescribe humility to other people uh, and especially especially people in this world who have already been pretty humble who have already been pretty stepped on and um, uh, ignored and even abused or traumatized. Uh, to then tell them they need to humble themselves. It's it's not a universal thing. And she recognizes and, and speaks to that. Uh, but also understands um, that, you know, not, not an abusive kind of humility, uh, but a healthy humility helps us to understand kind of our right place. And so maybe, maybe we've been kind of down low. Uh, and so this practice of humility is actually bringing us up. Whereas a lot of us, you know, you know, we we lived in a a, a place of, of of some level of privilege, and we're up here, and so we need to be brought down lower, right? And so that we all have kind of our right uh, and good place. You um, know, somebody I read in a paper that Mahomes is a is a very humble person. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to bring that up. No. <laughs> 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 you know, and that's it. I've, I've listened, and he seems like that. He's right. Not... I, I've listened to some sports radio these last couple few weeks, and of course, everybody's talking about the the Chiefs, and and they they brought some national guys on, and they're like, man, we just really want to hate Mahomes because he's so good, but he's just such a great guy. <laughs> he's just a humble guy, and he seems to uh, have figured that out. Uh, and, and so, and I mean, I that's what. That's what we see, right? Who knows for sure if, if, if that, that would be the case if we met him, but he sure seems to. Uh, and so, yeah, we, this was somebody that knew him. That knew him. And like, we, we, we noticed that, right? We yeah. see 
We see that in people. Well, if you hear them talk after games and such too, you know, yeah, it's yeah. always the team. It's right. the team, okay. uh, not so much himself. And yeah. um, also, I I really think that he tries hard to be a good dad. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's very aware of his having two little children that he wants to be an example for. Right. You know, right. um, not just in the way he plays football. Sure, sure. Okay. You want to invest in the community. Yes. And that's it. We notice that in people. We can see that yeah. pretty quickly, can't we? Um, and again, we always say shaking Patrick Mahomes' hand, but we can see that sometimes even through the screen. Mm -hmm. But then the people whose hands we have shaken, right? I mean, people that we've met, people who've been around, we can see that humility is something that draws us. Um, I mean, it's tough because we've got so many, so much of our culture is is looking for the loud and looking for the brash and looking for the bold and fighter. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, and even in in the NFL, that's kind of the the norm. Uh, and and so to find somebody in in our lives that, that demonstrates something else, we we find ourselves at least if we slow down enough, attracted to that. And I think that's what she's asking us to do, is think about humility in, in those kinds of ways. Well, and, and I noticed you're coming down to this level for people who need humility, mm -hmm. the way we think of it, and people coming up who need uh, a humility that brings them, lifts them up. Yeah. Um, and it's an equalizing, yeah, an right. equity kind mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. between and among people, but also within yourself, um, realizing that you have good points and uh -huh. you know things you need to work on yeah. and bringing them together in a centering focus right 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 yep yeah. and um that's exactly right and she she uses another centering focusing and also um kind of a groundedness let me read this quote she says humility is a necessary practice for spiritual growth the word is derived from uh, uh humus you know humus like the, the yeah the, uh, rot, the dirt and the leaves and the kind of um, material that has rotted on the ground, right? That's that's humus. Um, uh, she says humus, which means earth. Humility is at heart being about being well grounded and rooted. Humility is also about truth telling and radical self honesty. It is about celebrating the gifts that we have been uniquely given in service of others, as well as recognizing our limitations. And our woundedness, and so she, you know, uses this idea of humility as something that, that draws us. Um, all right, so there's a, a ton more in there, but what I want to do now is uh, invite invite you. Let's let's take a big, broad look at kind of where we're going over these next several weeks, and um, and I will share screen. Um, David, was that you that said that there's a, a workbook also on this? Yes, it is, because I got it. You got the workbook. Uh, oh. I do. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to join every day, because every other Tuesday, I really don't get off work until 1230. So, right. Um, so I got the workbook just to kind of help put yeah. things in perspective for myself. <laughs> Let's talk about where you got that. Yeah, yeah right. Let's talk about yeah. That. I buy everything on Amazon. I'm sorry, but, and I know I shouldn't. Um, yeah, because I got the book is on Kindle and I got the workbook on Amazon and it, I don't know, it's just a few dollars. Well, that's, that's pretty a quickly. point. Ebooks are widely available. Oh, you true. Can, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If right. you'd like to read it uh, online, you can get the ebook of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds like the workbook is kind of shifting even further, right? Not only to say, no, I want to have a piece of paper with this on it, but I want to have a piece of paper that I can write on and I can um, kind of re-engage. I would love to see the workbook on this uh, because I have several times as I've read through some parts of this, it's like, oh, yeah, this that would be good if we had, you know, a way to, uh, like she talks about different, uh, practices that you could, you know, have a piece of paper, but a workbook would be great because you just do it. There it is. You're kind of fast. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's pretty little. Look it up. Uh -huh. Oh, holding it. Oh, camera. Hold on. 
Cool. Is it by the same author? Or, I mean, it's yep. sometimes the, the work uh, is by so. somebody else. It's about her book, anyway. Right, right, right. But sometimes the work is by, the, by a different author. Yeah. We can see that um, on a search. That's right. Well, uh, I'll, you can show it to me later. I want to see it later. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We are going to um, kind of walk through, and you can see this online, correct? The mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because uh, what I want to do is show you kind of the uh, where we're headed over the course of the next uh, several weeks. Uh, the, the first week, uh, Ash Wednesday week, is um, an invitation to fast from consuming. Is it be possible to make it bigger than that? A little. Oh, that's good. Yeah. But then we lose the. Uh... Then you lose the whole. How about that? Does that, that's that work? Yeah. Okay. That. So fast from consuming and then embrace simplicity. So you'll start to see here the theme is exactly the question Dixie started with, right? Why can't we bring something into our lives? And and a listen rule often will do that. Like maybe it'll and say, well, I'm going to read my Bible every day, or I'm going to stop and pray every day, or I'm going to do something, not just fast from something. Uh, but what she uh, does in, in the course of the, the several weeks is both. Uh, and so as you can see, it's not fast from anything specific as fast from TV even, uh, but fast from consuming. And here in a minute, we'll talk a little bit about that idea is what it means to, uh, to consume. Uh, and then she replaces it with embracing simplicity. Uh, okay, then the so that's the technically the Ash Wednesday week. Uh, she calls it Ash Wednesday, Ash Thursday, Ash Friday, and Ash Saturday. I've never heard. <laughs> uh, I think I kind of love it. So, um, and then uh, so the week official week one is an invitation to fast from. Uh, this is this is a good one. Multitasking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in this section, <laughs> that doesn't ever work in my life. <laughs> Fast from multitasking and inattention and embrace full presence to the moment. That's next week. Then the uh, uh, third week is to um, fast from scarcity anxiety. Um, I, I, I'm resisting the temptation to talk about each of these. I mean, we can, we're going to have a whole week to talk about it. But, right. Um, and then embrace radical trust in abundance. Okay. Sorry, this take it's all. I thought it'd be cool to actually type them out so you can kind of experience them. You could enjoy this together. Um, an invitation in week three to fast from speed and rushing. Oh. <laughs> it's been a long seven weeks, isn't it? <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's <meddling>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm in class starting this week, so it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> uh, there's another one too. I've got one here in a second that you're going to have to uh, uh, you're going to have to figure out what to do with during your class. Because uh, I use these, I use this in a, uh, a devotional for Ottawa, and I realize there's a lot of students that are going to be. Oh well, my this says I don't have to do this, so my my professor shouldn't expect this from me. Um, speed and rushing and embrace slowness. Oh, that's not right. Not passing, pausing. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Yep. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm gonna be wearing the glasses on top of my head. Make sure it's, right. <laughs> it's in a weird kind of font, and so some of these words are odd. Okay, so the week four is a, a fast. Oh, this is a good one. Fast from. Holding it all together. 
and an embrace of tenderness and vulnerability. Week five is an invitation to fast from planning and deadlines. Oh, dear. <laughs> and an invitation to embrace unfolding and ripening. Okay, let's see. You can see here in a minute why I'm doing it this way. Did I miss a thing? You're supposed to forget about your taxes. That's right. Um, they will ripen. Oh, here it is. Here's one last one. Okay. And then the last one is a fast from certainty. And embrace mystery and waiting. Well, those things can just change your life. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and how many weeks are we supposed to do this? <laughs> seven. So seven, seven Tuesdays. Um, uh -huh. Ash Wednesday we concluded, and so they she has technically six weeks, but then Ash Wednesday week is the first. Uh, what are you so say, Marcia? I was going to say as you get older, it really is easier to do those things. I think so. <laughs> I think so. I think there's some of this that that feels um, feels different. Uh, I mean, speed and rushing is probably there's a different pacing for those who are retired. Um, and in some ways that's not, that's not as big a problem, but, but what I would think she would say to that would be, uh, oftentimes folks who are retired, uh, are in this already more naturally, but they don't know if they want to be right. I think there's a sense of, uh, well, I'm, I'm in a secondary part of my life. I can't go as fast as I used to. I can't rush. I can't, if I could, I would. But her point is fast from it on purpose to embrace slowness and pausing and to be more intentional about it. Um, when you all can, when we get to that, we can talk about that or all of these, right? But I, I, I think there's probably wisdom to that, Marcia, in a lot of ways that as we age, we, we learn some things. And so we, we learn some of the wisdom that, that she's in, in inviting us to, to learn. Um, okay, so, so as we are doing these seven weeks, we're also going to have seven days of each week. And so she has a practice for us every single day of the week. Again, this is stuff we're not going to necessarily do it all of them. Um, but um, but we we can if you get the book, you can. Uh, also, if you um, if you wanted to. Where is it? Here it is. If you wanted to um, get do all of them, then, then you could buy the book or. Um, we'll do enough that we can kind of get a taste of it over the course of this. And I know I spent a lot of time in basically introduction of this, um, but I think this is helpful so that we know where we're headed on this. Uh, so the first one is the practice of Lectio Divina, uh, which is, a lot of you know that, that is a, um, a practice of a holy reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She'll have a scripture reading uh, for each of these uh, weeks, and then that'll be a day that we, again, if you if you wanted to do this, you know, full bore, then you on a Sunday could do a lectio, uh, and then each one would be different. Now, of course, the first week's going to be off anyway because it doesn't have seven days because of Ash Wednesday, uh, which we'll see here in a minute. But uh, it, on a full seven day week, the second day then is a breath prayer. Um, and a breath prayer is, by what it sounds, it is it's kind of a way to, to physically engage yourself in, in a prayer experience. And so um, just kind of as you move into a, a still place, you're able to um, see your body changing in the way that it approaches God. 
Uh, okay, the third one is um, something that, that overlaps some with what she did with her photography stuff, and this is Visio Divina. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can probably figure it out from the, uh, um, the word roots there. This is kind of a, a holy scene, uh, and so mm -hmm. it's holy reading. Uh, it is a, a scene of an, a, an object or a a picture or something and when she she has written her books on uh, photography she asks us to go on these kind of visio divina walks go into the world and go look for look for god at, at work in the world um and then that's day three um okay and then day four is overview of meditations with desert elders so her point is to say that some of these these Amas and these Abbas, these uh, desert mothers and fathers, uh, have written some wise words uh, that we can then embrace. And so, um, try putting desert, not dessert. Um, we're skipping chocolate. It gets even tougher when we start talking about it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> desert wisdom, right? We'll, we'll, we'll shorten it that way. Uh, so, wisdom from uh, desert elders. And that'll be, again, on day four, depending on how we do it. Um, okay, day five is contemplative walking. So this mm -hmm. kind of overlaps again when she asks us to do the Visio Divina uh, and the photography stuff. Uh, sometimes she would ask us literally to go out and to, to see things. Um, well, Visio Divina can be just looking at flowers or looking at a picture while you're here, but contemplative walking um, is, is going out in a contemplative way uh, into the world. I'm going to run out of Space, but I put all that in. I was going to be walking. Um, and then number uh, day six is what she calls imaginative prayer. To prayer. Oh, not quite. Mm -hmm. Well, we could do that. We could do two lines. We'll do contemplative walking. So that goes to the next slide. Um, so imagine the prayer is, as, as, as you could probably imagine, right? It's, it's a way to, to pray in a way that uh, puts yourself perhaps in a scripture passage or puts yourself in a place. And so it's kind of a guided meditation, a guided prayer to do that. And then day seven uh, is uh, basically a, a ritual or a... Um, 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 You've got a lot, this is a little bit more complicated category, but it's something that you can do at home, uh, kind of do on your own. If you're doing this as a spiritual retreat, then it's something that you do on that day. Uh, but we can do it kind of as our homework. We'll do some of those as our homework to say, consider doing something like this when you when you leave. Uh, it's kind of a ritual to do uh, at home. Uh, and and then, uh, then there's these uh, reflection questions she has at the end of each uh, chapter. And then... Uh, a blessing that we'll read uh, together. So, um, what do you hear? What do you hear in this? Are you, are you more more invited? Are you more interested? Are you now terrified? Are you already bored out of your mind? What uh, what what do you hear as you hear kind of the the scope of what we're going to talk about? Kind of intrigued by the hippy dippiness of it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it is much more of a not an intellectual study of um you know of the greek or of the you know historical critical context but let's let's be together in a different way yeah yeah i like it yeah i like the reminder because i would not have thought of some of these uh directions yeah 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 i'm it really um intrigued is one word but also fascinated just by <clears throat> the um, breadth um, of thinking and contacting emotions. And right, right, right. Yeah. It, it, to me, that kind of um, makes you more aware of your surroundings and your feelings and what you're seeing. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that is the hope. Um, you know, somebody said earlier, it's like if you're going to do something for six weeks and then quit doing it, 
then it's not really a helpful practice, right? But the hope is that you can kind of engage your world differently and learn over the course of six weeks how to do that so that some of that residue may not be as intentional as, as the, the book will lead us over these next several weeks, but you can continue to be in the world and engage in the world with that kind of intentionality. But it could bring a whole different perspective. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what you say? Oh, just that it's it seems like it begins something that you can continue yeah. to actually mm -hmm. do. Uh yes. Uh and so that's that's the, the question that David said. Can we get a copy of this? And so um what I will do is I do it a couple different ways. I can print it out for the folks here and then I can send it, Margaret, to you and Deva. Uh so you can have. Uh this is this is uh obviously it's a, a I did it in chart form. Uh, it's not like you have to cross off every day to do it right uh, as much as, okay, here's kind of where we're going as a reminder. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. you stick your, um, oh, on, your, on your bedroom uh, mirror in your bathroom or something. Uh, and that way you can kind of see, hey, this is this is what's coming and this is how I'm uh, moving in this direction. Or, or here in a minute, we'll we'll talk about one way that you can, can use that. So yeah, I can get uh, copies of that for folks. She doesn't have a chart or anything like this, but I that's the way the way my brain works, the the seven and seven just kind of felt like a a way to do that. So this is helpful to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So as we begin then, and again, this is a shortened week. Um, no, we won't do all of this introduction every time. Um, we'll have to, uh, we'll, we'll jump basically straight into some of this stuff. And each week, you know, I'll have picked out, or Christina will have picked out uh, three or four or five or six or seven of these, who knows? Uh, and we can be flexible on, if we want to pause on, on one more than, than another, then we can do that too. But we don't have to walk a long ways, do we? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Because I walked out and put some in my trash can last night, and there was the moon. And so, yeah. so you, get, you just did it. You it did exactly what you provided long you to. That's right. It doesn't have to be. In <laughs> fact, that you know, she would she would probably say the, the the shorter the better, right? Because you can then be more thoughtful with each step to say what have I missed in the rushing, in the running away from everything for so long because I'm going so fast because I got to get so far. Yeah. But you don't. Yeah. And there's and all of a sudden there's the moon. <clears throat> well, uh this week uh, she invites us to uh, to fast from consuming and embrace simplicity. Any ideas what she might mean about that? Well, in case you had a list of, oh, I need to go out and get this and get that. Yeah. <clears throat> this is, you know, food that you really have to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, <clears throat> you know, you can you can wait seven weeks to get, get that particular thing first. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think more of it in downsizing. Mm -hmm. Again, as you mm -hmm. get older, you mm -hmm. realize you have so much junk that yeah. you don't need. Right. And uh, everybody really started to do that. And, uh, it it is quite rewarding yeah. and the simplicity that comes along yeah yeah it's beautiful it's very rewarding yeah i don't consume mm -hmm. much at all anymore i still wear the same old clothes oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, does, does consuming uh, lots of reading count you know, she talks about that some of the words. She was like, I don't, I don't think this should count on my book collection because I really want to. Uh, uh, but uh, I, think, I think of fasting from um, reading in a way that feels. Um, like oh, it takes you away from God. Well, right, right. Right, right. It makes it feel to. Um, you, can, you can consume ideas and consume words in a way that is uh, kind of an unhealthy power structure, right? Mm -hmm. To say, well, I know Definitely. this, I know this, I know this, and the knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there are folks that are like, look at the size of my bookshelf, and look how many books I read this week. And, uh, oh, and, and I'm, yeah, and I'm so smart. I saw this and that. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. It, it, the, the consuming of knowledge can be the problem, right? Yeah, right. 
Whereas simplicity maybe means, you know, I can spend a little bit longer on this one book or I can maybe read a book again instead of just, you know, crossing more books off my list uh, and, and, and simply embracing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Think about it. So would that make sense, do you think, compared to from what you've heard from her today? Does that make sense? Yes. One of the things with embracing simplicity with the Vizio Divina, um, it has become a thing with our bus lot that when there is an absolutely stellar sunrise, we draw call everybody's attention to it. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's so, cool. That's cool. Because we're all out on the road before the sun comes uh -huh. up. So uh -huh. So you like get on the radio and tell yeah. everybody, hey, look east. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, has anybody seen the sunrise today? Oh, that's so gorgeous. cool. That's great for you guys. That's so cool. Because um, you've got to share it. You can't keep that to yourself. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> And I, and I think, well, we'll get to that with some of this other stuff. Of, of what is desert wisdom? I'm not sure. So desert wisdom, that's, so you, she will have a passage from a a, a desert monk. Oh, I see. Um, a, a woman or a man that, that lived in the desert in those kind of early years, the first couple, 300 years of the church, that we recorded a lot of their, their wisdom. And so she will have a passage from that. And and have us kind of contemplate that. Um, and again, not not a long passage. Another thing to to consume, right, Margaret? It's not like, oh, I read fifteen things from fifteen different monks today. Yes. But a few words that we can kind of um, take it slowly. It's the same practice with Lectio Divina. Instead of I'm going to read two and a half chapters and maybe two and a half lines and maybe a lot mm -hmm. smaller. Our, well, a uh, couple Sundays ago in Sojourners, we did poetry. Yeah. And right. Cal wrote one of his, read one of his poems that he wrote. Uh -huh. And uh, there was only one line, I mean, there was a line in it that I want to remember. Yeah. And it was, Hope is the oxygen of my soul. Oh, uh, wow. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, I. I, Thank you, uh, Pat. And I like, I think maybe grace, but you can put insert so many words in that. Yeah, yeah. Joy. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, but nice. but keep it simple. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What were you gonna say, Margaret? Oh, it's past. That's all right. Okay. I thought of um, kind of along with what I heard earlier over there, but. Fasting from consuming, I think for me, is trying to use what I have mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of, mm -hmm. you know, always trying to bring other things in. Right, right. Look at what I have first and what mm -hmm. can be done with it. Right, right. Well, of course, the other connection is... Um, Fasting from consuming means rethinking our lives as consumers. When you think about how much of our society is based on the need for consumption, right? Conspicuous consumption, it's a, it's a thing. That's what I've always said. If they were working on my purchase of things, <laughs> 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 the right, right, right. And I, the economy right. requires that. But then, you know, I right. think a lot of, Plan a lot of, is yes, that's right. I mean, a, a lot of ecological uh, concerns ask, do you really need all of those? Where, where things? you, where you make your purchases as well. And right. You that's can right. support right. small family businesses mm -hmm. and get 90% of the things that you need. Right. The versus, price. Going on to Amazon and yeah, lining yeah. Jeff Bezos's pockets. Right, that's right. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and that's what she's asking us to do. Not that we don't ever go to Walmart or don't ever go to Amazon or don't ever go, you know, consume things, but um, be thoughtful about the things that we consume before we just go out to buy. Ask, do we need this? And she says it this way. She says. Um, these first few days of Lent, I invite you to consider those physical things you could do without as a way to give more focus on the less tangible things that hold importance, like relationships. 
From there, in the rem remainder of the season, we will focus on patterns and beliefs that we can fast from to bring us into deeper connection with the Holy One. And so uh, she uh, she asks us not to, to not to sell our possessions to give them to the poor, right? Even though Jesus asked that of, of, uh, of the rich man. But I think as in his asking, he understood that this rich man made those possessions his life. And mm -hmm. so if he mm -hmm. to follow the life of Christ, then he needed to get rid of that life first. I read a quote, uh, supposedly it was Doris Day, said if you have two coats, one of them belongs to someone else. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's the paraphrase of John the Baptist, right? I mean, John the Baptist says, if you have two coats, give, give one to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so let's let's do, and again, we're not going to have time for, for all of these even today because we've had such a, a long intro, but let's do a, a couple of these um, um, different, uh, let me see, let's just do, let's start with Lectio. I don't want to rush through any of these. So let's do a, a Lectio uh, reading of uh, um, um, Matthew 4. If you remember Matthew 4, it's the, uh, the passage uh, in which Jesus is... Um, Led into the desert, and so she makes a connection between the desert connection of Jesus and the desert mothers and fathers who also went into the desert seeking seeking the culture connection to God. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read this text um, and uh, invite you. So I'm going to read through it uh, twice, and as I read through it, I want you to listen for a word. Uh, the way she says it, listen for a word or phrase that shimmers. Mm -hmm. Something that shimmers to you. Um, and then we can talk, we can share some of that. Then Jesus was led up by the spirits into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yeah, we can see each other's faces. Was there a word or a phrase that shimmered? Led by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. so it, um, instantly, I got a picture of like ancient Celtics would call them wisps. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it just shimmering lights. Yeah. And it's spirits. And so literally that that phrase sparkled to me. Uh -huh. That's great. They're shimmering that happened. I was struck by famished mm. because that is really a physical need. And yeah. To substitute the word of God is really something beyond our ken almost. Uh, but yeah. uh, it, it sustained Jesus. For sure. Yeah, I noticed that word too, Margaret. That was one of the words that shimmered in Spanish. Uh, any others that you would like to share? Well, when I uh, heard that the spirit led him into the desert, 
I was thinking of the line in the Lord's Prayer that lead us not into temptation. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if, uh, if that was the reason Jesus put that in his perfect prayer. Yeah, it's like, don't do this again. This was no fun. Yeah. Right. Say anybody else. Don't do this to anybody else. I can't handle it. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's wise. That phrase implies intentionality, too, you know? The Spirit led him to be tempted. Right? To be tested. Not led on the Spirit, and nope, there was the devil. Right, right. Jumped up behind a cactus. The Spirit knew it was there. Well, let's take a, a, another reading. Let's do another reading. And this time she says, allow the word or phrase to unfold in your imagination, welcoming images, feelings, and memories. Good. You've already started to do that a little bit with your uh, your wisps. Um, but whatever, whatever phrase or word shimmers for you, may it uh, continue to open and blossom as we read it again. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Once again, with the wisp, their intentions are not always good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can think about the word as food. Yeah. Does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Let me read it a fourth time, and she says, this time, listen for the invitation being offered to you in the midst of whatever life is bringing you. And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I'm struck by the fact that Jesus answered every temptation with the word of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, we would have <laughs> made bread. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, that's something. Yeah. 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 But he was so I mean, deeply ingrained in that scripture that he knew, he knew how to respond. And that's the way we should be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I kind of wonder, you know, um, when he went to the desert for those 40 days, um, someone has mentioned, and I don't remember where I saw this or who, where I heard this from, but it was to come to terms with what God is calling him to do um, and to understand what that is. And so um, when I think about Lent and the testing, <laughs> testing us um, and testing um, our commitment and our relationship with God and what he's calling us to do individually as a person. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so interesting to me that uh, we don't know when we're, ca we're called into the desert either. Mm. <laughs> Right. Yeah. We that's, don't always recognize yeah. the temptation. 
Yes, that's exactly right. No, it's so often in hindsight that we see both of those. They're like, oh wow, that was the desk, you know. <laughs> oh wow, we were we were being tempted. In the moment we don't. And that's it. Maybe Jesus didn't either. All he knew was the scripture and knew that in this moment, um, we we don't know exactly what he saw or how he saw it, but in this moment he looked down and saw a loaf of bread looking like rock and said, I'm mm hungry, -hmm. and made the choice. To recite scripture instead of doing what, what most of us could have done, right? Well, or a, a rock looking like a loaf of bread. <laughs> what's yeah? What's that, Deva? A rock looking like a loaf of bread, yeah. <laughs> tempting us, you know, that's, with that's something right. that may appear to be mm -hmm. right uh, enticing that may not necessarily <laughs> in that root of it be enticing. Well, and if you're that hungry, uh, you'd be willing to uh, see a rock that way, too. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. right. And, and Satan is the great deceiver. Mm -hmm. And knowing, recognizing that sometimes is difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, We'll continue doing this. I think Lectio might be one of the things that we'll try to do maybe pretty much every week, just because I think there's an important grounding in that, in that uh, story. Um, but uh, she also invites, so again, all these different categories. The last one in the, the list is uh, a creative ritual. And this week she invites us to, uh, to create an altar. Anybody ever made an altar in their home? Um, it um, sometimes we think about somebody who's died or a loved one or something, and you can kind of put their picture up and maybe things that they they, they love to have or they love to uh, to do. Um, she's not meaning that in particular. She's simply meaning um, the way she writes it is a space where we indicate our desire to show up each day to our prayer practice. It helps to embody our desires for this season and time of retreat in daily life. An altar is a liminal space, a doorway between worlds, and reminds us of our holy longing to connect to the sacred in the midst of the ordinary. Uh, so she said you can put a, a, some kind of symbol, a candle, uh, a bowl of water. Um, a, a, it could be a, a Bible, or it could be some prayer beads, or it could be... Uh, some, something that you could uh, also use in that space. And so if you have a space in your house that's kind of out of the way, I wouldn't put it like in the vestibule, but it's kind of out of the way, uh, consider doing that. Uh, creating an altar, just kind of a space for this, uh, a liminal space in between your physical living space and the spiritual experience that you're hoping for in these next several weeks. And uh, again, it doesn't have to be anything too elaborate. Uh, but whatever is meaningful for you, maybe you put a little, um, a little speaker and you can play some, uh, play, play music as you're, uh, sitting and, and kind of praying and thinking. So as we do some of these different, uh, practices, um, maybe this, this week before next Tuesday, um, work on your altar and then maybe read Matthew four a couple of few more times or read it every day. If that's a, a meaningful way to do that. Um, to the anything else she says, yeah, don't let it be too complicated. Remember, you can always add to it as the weeks unfold. Uh, so you can add different parts to the altar. So think about it. Maybe you want to do something. Maybe you want it to be outside. Maybe you have a spot on your deck or your spot on the in your backyard. You can make an, an altar. Um, what do you think? I have a cor corner in my living room which doesn't get used. We have a living room and a family room, and the living room hardly ever gets used. But I have a corner that I call my quiet time chair. Yeah, there and you I have go. All my devotional materials there, mm -hmm. and that's that's where everybody knows in the family, and it's been that way for a long time. Uh -huh. <laughs> they don't bother me that's when right. I'm you get your quiet time chair. You don't mention it, <laughs> and that's your altar, right? It's similar. So I think the closest I ever came was. An Advent wreath, a personal one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another kind of, again, it's just a, a liminal um, 
awareness. It's a physical thing, um, kind of drawing your attention to more spiritual realities. Um, you know, some people think that's just weird. That's hippy dippy, right? That's just weird. I don't know about that. Um, like, give it a, ch a chance. <laughs> give it a, a try, uh, and see if there's maybe a way that this this speaks to you. Um, because then her final reflection question is is this. Because again, part of the point of, of, of doing this is to kind of step away from what is normal and what is expected into another space. And so she asks, what true hunger do you sense emerging if you strip away the excess consumption? Mm -hmm. you let that be a question for your your quiet time, your altar time, your, your week, as you think about how you might receive and lay aside this season. Well, let me close with our um, blessing. Steve Alter Painter writes for this week that uses some imagery of, of Ash Wednesday and uh, reminds us of the, uh, the power of God's love. Holy Creator, you formed us from the dust of the earth, gathering up mud and dirt in your warm hands, molding and shaping and sending your spirit through us until we came alive and breathed and danced and loved. These dusty origins began with stars exploding miles away with eons of light expanding and contracting to arrive in this tender human form. May we remember our roots in earth's rich soil and heaven's luminous reach. May we know ourselves as radically and tenderly flesh, but also radiance of spirit, sustaining our every moment. May death become a sister, as our friend St. Francis taught, a wise one to help us see all that is essential in our lives. May she help us to yield thoughts, patterns, and ways of being which distract us and exhaust us and empower us to inhabit the fullness of love's call. Strip us of regret, so when our physical end does finally arrive, we can step across that bright doorway with arms wide and hearts open, ready to be gathered back fully into your embrace. Amen. Amen. <laughs>